In this video, I'm delighted to be driving a 1951 Citroen Traction Avant. Oh, this is going to be fun. So the Citroen Traction Avant, one of the most advanced cars of the 1930s, but it wasn't the first front wheel drive car. It has front wheel drive. It wasn't the first car to have all hydraulic brakes, but it does have those. It wasn't the first car to have monocoque construction, but it also has that as well. But perhaps it was the first car to bring all these things into one package. Uh, there are a few of uh, manufacturers. Um, Lancia was at the cutting edge of monocoque construction as well. But uh, yeah, some very interesting thinking here and a car with a very short gestation period. The development history is quite lengthy and complex and I don't want to go on about it for hours. Uh, the important thing is that I think it was 1932, André Lefebvre, who was previously an engineer of Voisin, uh, was given the brief to come up with this car. Now, it's not like he had a blank sheet of paper because I think Citroën through Bud, who uh, actually did all the pressings, they, they um, licensed Citroën all the technology to press the body shells for steel cars, something Citroën was already doing. Um, they, they had, through other manufacturers and their own engineer, Joseph Ledwinker, who is only distant related to Hans Ledwinker of Volkswagen fame, uh, they, they had a front wheel drive car that they were trying to get into production in America. Um, so the, all the thinking was there. It would have been very much in Andre Citroën's mind that this could be a good way to proceed. Citroën, he, he liked to be at the cutting edge, um, but he also liked to keep his costs down, which is why he was using these steel presses to stamp out car bodies, whereas a lot of his rivals were still doing aluminium formed over an ash body. Very labour intensive, very costly. Whereas if you initially buy a very expensive press, you can then just keep stamping out bodies and your costs go down. It's all absolutely marvellous. So here we have the heart of the beast, the 1911cc engine, which was available from launch in the 7 Sport. The other size you, engine you can have was a 1.3 litre at launch in 1934. That 7 refers to the fiscal rating of 7 horsepower, 7 CV. But pretty soon they changed the engine to a 1.6 litre engine. And, and this was called the Sport, even though the 1.9 litre engine does not have a fiscal rating of seven horsepower. It's all very, very confusing. This engine had a really long production life. It came into being for the Traction Avant in 1934, remained in production until 1981 under the bonnet of the Citroen H-Van, one of which was covered in a recent test. It's the same engine. Uh, the main difference between this and the um, H-Van is that the gearbox is in front here. We can see the gearbox um, down here uh, behind the grille, a little vulnerable. But uh, doing it this way around means you can have the engine all the way to the engine further back, way behind the axle line, better for handling. And it was a system also used on the Renault 4, the Renault 6, the Renault 16 and the Citroen DS, most notably. The engine started off with 46 brake horsepower um, for the 1911cc engine. It went up to, um, I think, about 60 by the end of production. This one's from 1951, so fairly near the end. I think it's about 57 horsepower, somewhere in that region. Produced at a very lethargic 3,800 revs. These are not revy engines. While Citroen wanted a better engine than the DS, they couldn't afford to develop it, so they stuck with the tried and tested 1911cc engine. It's overhead valve, it's all um, iron. Um, it's uh, not the most efficient engine, but it, it's very good at delivering lots of torque, which it does with um, some aplomb. Just here, you can see the gear lever um, mechanism. It's um, quite a complicated affair. We will see inside what the inside of the gearbox looks like. And you can see we've just got a simple um, mechanical fan to keep things cool. One little detail I will bring your attention to is heating while we're here. There's a hole here. And what should happen, if you want the heater on, you have to get a pipe, which you clip here. It goes to just behind the radiator, so it can take hot air and pump it into the interior in just this one location. There's a bung in there because we haven't got the pipe fitted at the moment. We're in summer mode. So that stops your engine gases and heat coming into the cabin sort of i think i was getting quite warm in there anyway but yeah a very striking remarkable design we'll lower the bonnet now we're finished under there for now so while we've got some very advanced features on this car there's some design 
features that are definitely still 1930s. That bonnet just being one of them where you have to kind of latch it down the side, fold it over. Very, very 1930s. But for 1934, this was nothing short of radical. That monocoque construction allows the car to be much lower than normal because it isn't having to sit on a separate chassis. So the engineering is the work of um, Andre Lefebvre, who we've um, already mentioned. Uh, the engine, Maurice saint -Gerard. The styling of the car, which I think is definitely one of its more striking features, the work of Flamilio Bertoni. Now he's not related to the Bertoni we know so well, uh, the Bertoni with an E on the end. Uh, he uh, has an I on his, the end of his name, but he sort of smartened up the styling. He was a sculptor, really. Um, and I think that sort of shows in the way the, the lines flow around the car. Uh, he also did the 2CV, changed it from what was a corrugated shed on wheels to something that actually had a bit of style about it. He designed the Citroen DS, the Citroen Ami, a remarkably talented man who not en enough people know of. But yeah, the way this line just sort of curves around here, it's all very, very beautiful. There are many, many different versions of these cars and uh, they were produced in other countries as well. Slough um, in England produced probably somewhere in, in the low 20s in terms of thousands of these. So obviously with right hand drive and a few detailed differences because they had to use local components to avoid import duty. Uh, and there were different body styles as well. You could have a coupe, you could have a convertible, you could have a commercial. So the Commercial and the Familial were on a longer chassis and the Familial had three rows of seats so you could seat nine people inside and the Commercial had a hatchback and uh, I th think the Commercial came out in about 1938 with a split tailgate, uh, arguably the first hatchback. After the war when production restarted it had a full hatchback and the entire rear end lifted up and you know we're way ahead of cars like the Renault 16 so that's quite astonishing but even the basic traction event we have here this is a normal there was also a Legere which is the lighter version slightly shorter and slightly narrower it's hard to believe when you look at this one because it already seems fairly narrow but uh, it definitely has quite the wheelbase on it uh, I think we'd better start having a look inside and we'll take in some of the details in there so we have the joy of suicide doors to start with, which open nice and wide. And then one has to sort of step in like so and fold in around the enormous steering wheel. Uh, if we bring you on board, you can see a bit of damage down here because door seals aren't superb. So as you drive along, a bit of water does get um, onto the door cards. This isn't the perfect example, which is why I love it so much. It actually feels used. It has been the owner's daily driver at times. Um, but if I bring you in, come hither, uh, temporarily relieve the camera lady of her duties and give you a more detailed look at this interior. Here's the beautiful little speedometer. It's got a clock, sadly not functioning, uh, battery charge and your fuel, your essence. Uh, I think that's the reset there for the trip, but I'm not going to reset it. It might be important. We've got a couple of knobs. The owner doesn't know what they do. And he's also not entirely sure what these ones do but we have got wipers mounted at the top of the windscreen and operated by this switch here. We've got a little dainty interior mirror sitting nice and low. We've got the choke control here. That is as far in as it goes. And we've got the starter here. You pull to start the engine. But look, even the key is beautiful, beautifully detailed. Uh, this adjusts the ignition timing. So if you're starting the engine, you can retard the ignition to make it easier to start and then switch it up but obviously we've got the gear lever sprouting out the dashboard because that's an obvious thing to do it sort of it really does just sort of droop down so um, if I ping it back to neutral we've got first is down here and then we can go across and up and into second and down to third uh, so just a free speed gearbox with reverse located up here requires quite a firm hand and uh, we'll talk about gearboxes once we're on the move. Uh, the headlight control, exactly the same as a Citroen 2CV. So V for veal, it switches between um, dip beam and side lights. And R for root, switches between dip beam and main beam. There would normally be a bit of a cover here. It seems to have gone missing. And Chris, the owner, has added 
separate indicators on their own little stalk. The control is usually down here. That's what you'd use. We've got screen wash as well, yeah? and, and a stereo, all mod cons, little umbrella, handle, handbrake parked under here, and even a little glove box full of um, information and CDs, because Chris obviously likes his music. You'll note we've got um, an opening windscreen, but that's not the only thing that opens. There's a separate vent somewhere, uh, which enables you to open this little flap here. So you can get ventilation that way, but th there are no baffles or anything. So um, if it's raining, that just chucks loads of water on your legs. Uh, via that, you can also adjust the level of the screen wash. Uh, up here, these are aftermarket, but very delicious little um, sun visors. We've also got a manual override for the wipers. So if it um, packs up or you just um, need a bit more pace, you can pull the switch and operate the wiper manually. You get a bit more sweep on it then as well. And then you just um, put it back where you want it to park and click it back in and it'll go with the motor next time. Um, if I pop the ignition on, I can demonstrate that the wipers are not the fastest that I've ever seen fitted to a car. Oh, we might do some external footage of the wipers. Yes. Um, let's do that now. Let's go straight to wipers. <laughs> straight to wipers. Yeah. So here we go. External footage of the wipers. I'm going to try and apply some screen wash and find it doesn't work. So we'll just go for one sweep. That's as fast as they go, even when the windscreen's wet. And there's a big click as the parking motor kicks in. I'm quite impressed with that. A uh, parking motor on uh, a 1950s car that was designed in the 1930s. I think that's quite good. But if we come back into the car again, uh, the pedal box area, you, you've obviously got the engine sits quite far back. So the throttle is kind of emerging from the hump of the engine cover and uh, quite a dainty little thing. And then you've got the two brake and clutch pedals crammed in here. So uh, it's all a bit tight and there's not really anywhere to rest your clutch foot other than under the pedal. But to be fair, most 1930s cars tend to be very narrow at this point. So uh, that's not such a big difference. But if we go back to a wider angle again, uh, the actual driving position is really, really comfortable. You've got this big steering wheel in front of you and uh, the visibility isn't too bad looking forward. Looking over your shoulder, there is a problem because you've just got this massive area you cannot see through at all. Now, the longer wheelbase cars tended to have an extra window, so they're perhaps a bit more practical in that regard. Uh, it might make it life easier if you're driving a right-hand drive one as well. This one was built in France in 1951. It was imported in the 1980s. So this is a timely point to mention the club, the Traction Owners Club here in the UK. Actually caters for all the pre-1957 water-cooled Citroen cars, the rear-wheel drive one and the front-wheel drive, because there isn't really a club that caters for just the rear-wheel drive Citroens. So uh, thank you very much. They invited me to do this test, and uh, I appreciate it very much. But let's hop in the back. We've just got a conventional door, as you more normally might expect. But if I hop in... Oh, it's uh, good news here. Look at the legroom. It's astonishing. Uh, so I imagine even the Legere must be fairly decent here. Uh, there's plenty of legroom to stretch out. You can't really see anything though because there is no window here. So you have to sort of lean forward to take a peek at what's going on. So if you want privacy, I mean this is just like being in a limousine. So uh, yeah, it's very, very impressive. There is so much space. As 1930s cars go, this is just extraordinary. And look how flat the floor is. There's no transmission tunnel because there's no transmission here. It, everything is up at the front, so they really were making the maximum use of that front-wheel drive technology. Now, when the Traction Avant came out, it didn't have a boot at all. Uh, this was all a fixed panel, so you had to reach behind the rear seats. They pretty swiftly realised that wasn't ideal, and I think from about 1936, uh, they came up with this solution, which is a drop-down boot. Uh, that gives better access. We can see we've got tools, spares, gear oil, um, Chris is well set up because he uses this car regularly. He likes to have everything to hand. Uh, from 1952, I think it was, the larger boot took over. And that's like a big hump here. So it's much better load capacity. And the Commercial still has that big hump. And it all lifts up as part of the tailgate. I've got a spare wheel under this cover. Uh, so that's nice and secure. I presume you access it 
from in here. Yes, there's a big um, thumb screw on the inside here so you can lock your spare wheel to the car, make sure no one steals it. Now this was a very, very clever car, but uh, it didn't all go swimmingly at first. For a start, the cost of developing this car uh, actually bankrupted Citroen. So in um, 1934, before they'd really got this car on the market, uh, the creditors went, enough is enough. And one of those creditors was Michelin, the tyre manufacturer. And we have some Michelins fitted here very fittingly. Uh, so Michelin took over and allowed Citroen to become the remarkable company it ended up being, making quite ridiculous cars. And I think Michelin sort of went, oh, well, this is our advertising. It's great advertising for our tyres. Uh, but there were other issues as well. Uh, the drive shafts were just, um, well, there were what's known as our zapper uh, joints at first, and they were so unreliable, they swiftly changed it to just a basic universal joint, actually two of them on the outer, to make sure you could get enough steering angle. This car, uh, if you come in for a closer look, has had CV joints fitted, more modern CV joints. Um, which are uh, much smoother in operation, don't wear out anywhere near as quickly. Of course, I see a telescopic damper there. Uh, in fact, this is probably a good point to talk about suspension, because I haven't mentioned that yet. The suspension is all independent by torsion bar. So if we come back out again, there are long uh, bars that go up to the bulkhead area, or the, the footwell thereof. So the torsion bar comes along and that controls the suspension. Uh, that was, again, pretty novel for the time. And uh, yeah, another one of those features that allows the car to feel so good when you're driving down the road. Initially, the steering was a steering box setup, but after a couple of years, they went to rack and pinion. And again, you got rack and pinion steering, independent suspension, hydraulic drum brakes, and that low slung body. These are driver's cars. Um, although by modern standards, perhaps not quite so much, but against the competition at the time where corners were treated by, with complete disregard by a lot of manufacturers. It was just absolutely astonishing. A few more notes on gearbox before we get started. Uh, one of the things to note is that originally these were meant to be fully automatic. Uh, it was a two speed system they were trying to develop, but they just could not get it to work. And it was a very, very late call to um, make this gearbox a manual instead, which is why the linkage is a bit Heath Robinson. This was very, very much last minute, oh, we can't launch this sort of thinking. Desperation at the end. And uh, it must have been heartbreaking for Andre Citroen to get so close to making this car his dream car. And then so many things at the end conspiring against him, running out of money, trying to compete with Renault, building a huge new factory. He just overstretched himself and sadly died um, a penniless man uh, before these cars were even allowed to become a success. So that's the downside of these cars. But uh, we, don't, we don't want to um, dwell on such things. Uh, I think we should go for a drive and see what these cars are really all about. One more thing to note on suspension, it's also fully independent by torsion bar at the rear. Apart from the very late um, six models, they did a six cylinder version and in 1954, ahead of the launch of the Citroen DS the following year, they fitted hydro pneumatic suspension to the rear of the big sixes, and they were called the 6H for hydraulic. So that gave them a chance to really test that suspension out in the public before launching the Citroen DS the following year. And they also fitted that suspension to H vans as it happens, so some of those you could raise and lower the back end. But uh, yeah, a good way of testing the technology just a bit before you launch it. A complete new spaceship upon the world. Right, so here we are behind the wheel, ready to set off driving. No seatbelts, not required on a car of this age. So we turn the ignition key, we just check we're in neutral, and it should just be a case of pull this and the engine will start. And there she is, coughing and spluttering a bit, maybe if we advance the timing up a touch. There we go. Uh, so the gearbox, we're over like this, we're wait for the gearbox to stop whirring, down into first, handbrake is a bit of a stretch, it seems to be on the passenger side, which oddly is in my right hand drive 2CV. We get the bike point and we shove that in and away we go. 
very very heavy steering but uh, we're off the steering is definitely on the heavy side just check we're clear here away we go gearboxes are a little fragile so double declutching does help just take your time on those changes There we go, we're into top gear. We are ambling along quite nicely. Now jumping out of more modern cars, it's easy to forget how good this actually feels. Uh, but a lot of 1930s cars, gearboxes are all over the place. They are monumentally slow. So while I would never describe this car as rapid, it just gathers pace really rather nicely. Uh, so yeah, returning to 1934 when these cars came out, they were really not a good buy at all. There were so many issues because there just hadn't been enough development. But uh, Citroen knew he had to get this car into production. So I, I, it, it's interesting to ponder if it had done just a few more months development, could they have ironed out some of those bugs? Could the car have been more successful? Could Citroen have paid off his creditors and would Citroen's history be very different? It's an interesting one to ponder. Uh, I'm just going to do a stretch of dual carriageway just to let the old girl stretch her legs a bit. So we just um, slowly change our way down to second. Wait for a gap in the traffic. There it is. We shall flash Mr. UPS man over because he let us out. Very kind of him. And uh, we're building up speed, there's 40. And we're getting on for 50 miles an hour. Now, obviously it's a free speed gearbox, so it's gonna get a little noisy at speed, but overall it's still fairly peaceful in here, I would say. I don't think it's that bad at all. A fair bit of transmission noise, but how old's the gearbox, we really don't know. But uh, it, it's very sedate. You're not having to fight to keep the car in a straight line because of the excellent rack and pinion steering. And the brakes offer uh, reassuring stopping power, I would say. I think we should go this way. I think that's enough dual carriageway. So it's one of the easiest pre-war cars to drive, I would say. I keep saying pre-war even though this is a 51, but to, win to all intents and purposes, this is still very much a pre-war car but it's one that is so very usable i say that you do have to be careful with the gearbox they can break um a little too much for most people's liking so oh, i'm trying to be smooth on this pull away but the clutch is quite sticky so yeah you don't do wheel spin starts for sure and you have to take your time over the changes but uh, this is only three speeds that's not really such a hardship. You can select third from so slow. We're not even doing 30 miles an hour yet. We're in top gear. So gear changing isn't something you have to do a lot of. But yeah, gearboxes can be broken. If you bump start the car, you can break them. But uh, people have tried a few different ideas to fit different um, gearboxes. I know some people have managed to fit Skoda transaxles to the Traction Avant. But uh, you don't want to get too far away from what makes this car what it is. So some upgrades might be an upgrade too far. But as you can see, we're making lovely progress here. The ride is very composed. The handling feels very secure, especially on those Michelin tires. But oh, gravity, we're fighting gravity now. It's all gone a bit dark, I do apologize. Come on, old girl, slog your way up it. And she just about has. But while these cars have a very loyal following within Citroen circles, uh, they don't really enjoy much of a classic following outside that. And I think that's a real shame. These are such capable cars. There's a group in France that take theirs all over the world. Uh, they drive through, you know, Morocco, Australia, wherever. They love going off adventuring in their traction advance. These are hardy cars when you treat them right so uh, once they ironed out the bugs they were very good cars indeed i'm gonna have to operate the windscreen wipers full speed captain 
Yeah. Not the quickest. Oh, we've got a bend. But we needn't panic. Because it all feels fine. It feels a much more modern car once you get into the bends. I must talk about electrics because this car has actually been upgraded to a 12 volt system, but the wipers are still 6 volts. So there's a clever box of tricks somewhere to take the power back down. Because uh, if you made these 12 volt, I think they'd be very quick, very briefly, and would then surely burn out. Now the slow build traction advance were 12 volt from the factory because they use Lucas Electrics to keep the parts quota up. So in many ways the slow cars make a better buy. Uh, not least that you actually sit on the correct side of the car for our roads. So there we go, the Citroen Traction Avance. An incredibly advanced car, one that I think deserves more of a following really. It's so clever yet so drivable. And uh, I can see why the, the um, owner occasionally uses it as a daily. It's fine, it can handle it, it's great. So uh, very enjoyable, nice to have ticked that box at last. Obviously as a bit of a Citroen fan, it's something I've been wanting to do on video for a while. So thank you very much to the Traction Owners Club do go and check them out and uh, look forward to seeing you in a future video. Farewell. Bonus clip. How do you crank start a traction avant which has the engine behind the gearbox? This is how you see the shaft spinning around in there that is directly connected to the engine so you can remove this get your handle out and still start your engine clever eh <laughs>